Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And hello to those of us watching, uh, to those of you watching the recording on our YouTube channel. I will just do a quick intro and then hand it over to our panelists. My name is Sanafik Gabru. I am YEP's Executive Director. For those of you who are not familiar with YEP, it stands for Your Ethiopian Professionals. We are a 501c3 organization that aims to be a platform for a community community members to connect, network, and work towards um, personal and professional goals. And as part of our personal development program, we have a series called Yup Finance, where we host events and roll out resources that really encourage our members to pursue a holistic path towards financial security. And we're very excited to partner with your DMV team for our session today. A quick disclaimer, this webinar is live, so if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A um, button to ask questions. We're also live on social media, so feel free to submit your questions there and hopefully get them addressed live. But uh, other than that, the session will be recorded and then we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel as well. So hopefully you'll have additional opportunities to engage with our panelists and then have your, your questions addressed. So I will hand it over to your DMV team. Thank you, Sanafik. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, everybody, at yep, uh, all the members, uh, we are super, super excited uh, to be here uh, today. We're big fans of yep and have, uh, uh, um, uh, um, you know, done a, a few events uh, with uh, yep. And so uh, we are excited about this. Uh, again, uh, some of you guys may know us, some of you may not know us. Uh, we are uh, your DMV Team Realty. Uh, we've been uh, in the area for the uh, servicing the DMV areas, helping thousands of buyers and sellers in the past uh, for the past 12 years. And so myself, uh, I'm the I'm the CEO founder of your DMV team. I have uh, D Harris, who are in, is our investment specialist and uh, one of the most experienced agents in the area. And so the right man to uh, speak on this topic and give you guys the breakdown. And then we have one of our top lenders. Uh, you know, he's the the money guy, uh, when it comes to buying your first home or investment property, having the right lender in your corner is so key. It's uh, Mike Allman. He's the branch leader, uh, senior loan officer from uh, uh, Movement Mortgage. Okay, so you guys want to say what's up, guys? Sure. How you guys doing? Uh, it's really it's very excited to have you here. Um, yeah, I was a YEP member. Um, from 2010 to about 2017. So yep, has been in my blood work for a long, long time in my DNA. Just to give you a quick sense, Yanni and I actually met at a yep happy hour event in 2013. Yeah. And we have been partners and I've been part of Yanni's team, the privilege to have been there for about eight years. So uh, not only do we know yep, we understand your mission and your goal. And it's really an honor to be here today. Um, I've been in this business for 20 plus years. Um, not only just as a real estate agent, but also as an investor myself. I invested on my first property in 1999. Um, actually became an agent later because I was so passionate about it. Um, so, you know, done residential, commercial investments, everything that you can imagine. And looking forward to sharing that information with you. And hopefully you guys will be able to, you know, gain something out of this today. I'm sure you will. And then, of course, Michael is the lender we use a lot. And Michael... To you. Thank you. Hey, perfect. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you guys having me here. Uh, my name is Michael Ullman. I've been a loan officer for going on 11 years, uh, all in the DMV area. Uh, I am also a real estate investor. Uh, made my first investment into real estate in 2011 and have been doing it ever since. Um, D, Yanni, these are my buddies and my uh, people that I, I talk to about real estate all the time. I uh, really appreciate you guys having me on here. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Um, I, if you post them here in the Zoom, that'll be helpful. Sanafek, I, I just made a membership request to join YEP. So if you guys approve it, then I can see the Facebook <laughs> uh, questions. But until then, I can't see the Facebook questions. But again, I'm happy to be here and would really, uh, you know, love to answer any question you guys have and, and, and appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. So um, we have a little bit of a Sanafik, can you make it possible for us to share the presentation? Sorry, I can't share the presentation. 
think you should be able to share now, Dee. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. All right. So we're gonna present, you know, we're gonna use our PowerPoint to discuss. We're gonna use this as a tool to kind of share some ideas with our you know topic with you guys. This is your DMV team as we talked. And then I'm gonna give this to um yeah. So let, let me let me go ahead. Yeah, yep. yeah. I don't I don't see anything on there. Just in case you haven't you haven't, you haven't shared anything yet, right? I have. I only see a, a white screen. Maybe that's me. Is that Mike? What do you? Yeah, no, I'm seeing the white screen too. D. Yep. Sorry, guys. Same. Um, As he's gosh. figuring that out, let me just kind of just give you guys some. Again, ultimately, uh, 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 you know, part of the journey is we kind of discuss as we've helped in the past twelve plus years you know, thousands of, uh, you know, clients and whatnot. Part of that is helping clients buy investment properties. But as you uh, saw as well, we ourselves have personal investments as well and our investors uh, and build in our personal portfolio. So we wholeheartedly believe real estate is investment is the ideal way to kind of invest in, you know, create wealth and the financial freedom. Uh, as we said, kind of in our, in our flyer, you know, the goal is to create cash flow streams that pay you. You know, and you have enough properties that create that cash flow to replace your income, then that's when you become ultimately financially free. You can choose to work or not, right? Um, so what we'll kind of go over today, and ultimately when we're talking about investment properties, we're talking about buy and hold investment properties, okay? Um, not, uh, you know, there's obviously uh, flipping and things of that sort that you can do as, a, uh, as an investor in that sense, but we're talking about buy and hold we believe again when you're flipping again. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a another avenue, but uh, when you're buying and uh, buying properties to to buy and hold rent and, and create cash flow, that is the way to kind of sustain and create a portfolio where again, ultimately you have an avenue where you're getting income from your properties. So what we'll kind of go over, I'll kind of just just uh, quickly uh, going going over the basics to qualify. I'm talking about the financials, you know, down payment, credit score, DTI. Reserves, are you allowed gifts, not gifts? Um, you know, one thing to consider as well, you know, you may be somebody that's already owns a home versus not own a home. There's avenues, even if you're not, if you're a first time home buyer, ways that you can ultimately uh, set yourself up to accelerate your real estate portfolio. Um, so uh, what, how about teaming up with people to invest, whether it be, you know, a partner, multiple people, uh, what to look for in an investment property, you know, type of properties, understanding the ideal uh, 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 the, uh, understanding whether a deal is perfect for a long-term rental uh, versus a short-term like Airbnb, Verbo, you know, understanding local regulations, uh, putting in an offer and how to get, you know, how to, about, how to go about negotiating the right deal. What happens once you're under contract, you know, the right way to deal with tenants. That's a big thing that we've seen a lot. You know, a lot of people, once they get their property, you know, how do you deal with tenants? As you know, DC, Virginia, Maryland, uh, ultimately have different rules in regards to all of those things. And so how to do that. And then, you know, baby steps to building your real estate portfolio, how to go about that. So I'm going to kick it off to D. He'll kind of start off with Mike uh, inputting uh, the financial aspects of that. So D, I'll hand it off to you. Okay. Okay. So Mike, this is getting the pre-approved. One of the first steps is getting pre-approved and I'm Mike, Mike is the man to talk about this. Sure. Thank you. All right. So for anybody on the call who already owns a home or has bought a property, um, you know, this concept will be fairly familiar to you. Uh, it's the pre-approval uh, process. Uh, when you're looking to buy your first home, it's, a, you know, the timing is a little different, right? You, you, you know, hey, my lease is going to end on a certain date or I'm looking to move out of a family member's house. Let me get pre-approved and then look for a house with an investment. It's a little bit different. You, you're likely already in a house and you're looking to, to add to your real estate portfolio. The first thing you want to do is talk to a lender. Uh, that lender is likely going to ask you some questions about what you're looking to do in terms of uh, investing, whether it be purchase an investment condo or a townhouse, a single family, multifamily maybe. Um, and that lender will, will give you some advice as to the next steps. Generally, you will apply with a lender. Um, most people are applying online, although you can certainly find some lenders that'll meet face-to-face -face if that's what you're more uh, interested in or, or you're more comfortable with. Um, you will uh, likely go through a credit check. It's important to have your credit verified to make sure that you have sufficient credit to purchase an investment. 
Generally speaking, to purchase an investment, you probably want to have about a 680 credit score. That is a bit higher than, you know, a, a traditional financing. You're looking to buy your first home or a home to live in. You may only need a 620 or so credit score. If you're looking to buy an investment, there's some uh, stricter uh, restrictions. So you probably want to have at least somewhere in the 680 range um, or better. Uh, in addition, a lender is going to be very much in tune with your down payment, where that money is going to come from. In a traditional purchase, you can get a gift for down payment. Family member can provide it or, you know, whatever. However, for an investment purchase, the funds need to be your funds. You cannot get a gift to fund an investment purchase. So you want to talk to a lender about the money you have available to put into an investment property. If you don't have the funds available yet, you might come up with a plan of action with that lender to come up with the down payment funds. Um, next step is discussing where you want to purchase a property. I know you won't necessarily be able to pinpoint exactly where you want to purchase, but you might have a general idea as well as discuss what the rents might be. And a lender will put together uh, this information and come up with a pre-qualification or a pre-approval, which will let you know what you qualify for from uh, an investment purchase standpoint. At that point, you'll talk to an agent, try to find properties, and the lender will get back involved once you find a uh, property. In addition, during the pre-approval stage, we're going to be asking for um, your documents. Uh, if you're a regular employee of a company, we're going to be asking uh, for your W-2s. Uh, if you are a business owner, we'll ask for tax returns. If you're a 1099 employee, we'll ask for 1099 and tax returns. Uh, we'll ask for recent pay stubs, make sure that you're still working, confirm your income. We'll ask for bank statements. Uh, we'll ask for a photo ID. Um, and if you're going to be using uh, funds from some other account, maybe liquidating a, a retirement account or liquidating an investment account, we'll ask to see that as well. But that's generally the pre-approval stage. Someone asked a good question. I appreciate you, you asking it. Uh, the question from Abebe is, can I use a line of credit for down payment? Absolutely. If you have a line of credit on your current property, you can use that line of credit to uh, withdraw funds from and use that for down payment. If you have like a credit card, that's different. You can't borrow against a credit card and use unsecured funds. But if you have a HELOC or a home equity line of credit against a property you own, you can absolutely use those funds for a down payment. So that's a great question. Perfect. So from once Mike has given you that, then they, you come to an agent like me, and I'm going to spend some time talking about um, what is a town, like what is a, um, what ready to consider an investment property. It could be a condominium. It could be a townhome. It could be a duplex, which is a two unit building. It could be a multifamily, which is three plus units. And then also for the more seasoned uh, investors, it could be a commercial property, but we're not going to get too much into commercial because that goes into a different lending structure with commercial lending, which, which is a whole other presentation by itself. Um, we've done them all. Um, so I want to share with you, I understand also not everybody's from the DMV. What we're talking about here applies anywhere in the country, really anywhere in North America. So I do want to make sure that you understand, even though we're DMV based, these concepts will work for any lender anywhere in your um, in your respective area, whether you're in Minneapolis or California or Texas and Dallas or Miami or Atlanta, wherever you are, what we're discussing really applies. So, you know, if you have an investment, if you're saying, okay, I have my own, my first condo, what's, you know, I want to buy a condominium or a townhome or a duplex. Those are the various options you can consider as an investment property. Um, in the next couple of slides, I want to present to you two different kinds of approaches. If you are early in your investment career, even if you're buying your first home, and Mike and I will go off, in this, off of this a little bit, um, this is a tool that people don't really use a lot or don't discuss a lot, but I really want you to think of real estate as a, as a wealth tool, right? Think about it. So if you bought maybe a condo or a multifamily now, think about a five to 10 year game plan here, okay? Think about you bought a condo and then you lived in it for two to three years. And then let's just say now you've paid it down and the mortgage is high en enough in your area that you could actually rent it. And then you can move to buy a townhome. Okay, think about this again, like as a five to 10 year game plan, 
Okay, you can use you, you can move rent your condo, make sure it's, it can cash flow so that it, that debt doesn't count against you. And then Mike will get into this a little bit. And then you can buy a townhome putting maybe 5% down. And then after a couple of years, you make sure that that's also cash flowing for you or covering the mortgage and your expenses. And then you can go to a single family and you can do all of these three steps without having to put 20% down, which is really what's required once you get going into investing multiple properties. And Mike, from a lender perspective, can you speak to this a little bit more since that's, you know, more in your wheelhouse? Yeah, absolutely. So sort of de-reference uh, this, you know, building out investments, or at least what we're talking about tonight is, is definitely uh, a journey. It's not a, uh, a, a, a short race. It's a, it's, it's a long marathon. So this is one strategy that is, is totally legal, totally doable. You can start by purchasing a starter home. You can live there for a year, turn that into a rental. By turn that into a rental, I mean you you get ready to buy another property. You, you sign a lease to rent out that property that you bought. You can then move to another home and put 5% down. Live there for another year, build up some, some money for a down payment do it again. Generally speaking, you want to go from a condo to a townhouse to a single house. It, it has to make sense. By that, I mean, you know, from an underwriting standpoint, you're moving up each time. You're not moving from a 5,000 square foot home to a one bedroom condo. That wouldn't look right for an underwriter. But if you're, you're moving from property to property and you're staying at least a year and you're turning that property into a rental um, by renting it out, you can then purchase another property with 5% down. Uh, the first one, uh, your first property that you're buying, for those that haven't bought, if you look at a multifamily home and the market that you're in has multifamily homes, that first property you can buy with an FHA loan and put as little as 3.5% down. Uh, as I said, I'm an investor. I've been investing for about 11 years. You know, D referenced that he's been investing for you know more than 20. Yanni's an investor as well. Um, you know, looking back, one of the when people say, "Hey, what do you regret? What didn't you do?" I regret that I didn't buy a multifamily as my first property with three and a half percent down. That's the best investment you can do for your first property. And, and I'll tell you, I, I invest a lot in Baltimore, so I in, in literally two, in 1998, I bought a, my first three unit building in in Baltimore. I lived in one of the units. I'm just giving you. I think it's reference. It's important, kind of. You see that not only are we doing this, are we do, advising people? We're doing it. Like I bought my first unit. Uh, the three unit, I lived in one, I rented the other two, they paid my mortgage, I lived for free in that building. And then I moved on from that building, I actually it had enough equity in it after three years, I took some money out of it. Um, I renovated the building, plus I bought a townhouse. And then I lived there for four or five years. And then I moved on, bought a single family house where we, where I live today with my wife and the two kids. And not only that, but we also have, I also have, you know, we have other multiple multifamily properties that we invested, but those are 20% down. But that mechanism is something for you to think about. In DC, for example, you could buy a million dollar property, like literally a $900,000 property for with three and a half percent down. And then Mike and I have helped several clients with this situation and they've moved on over time. And over these years, I, we've helped build wealth for people legitimately. They call us. I have, we have one client that has bought seven houses from me over the last 10 years. You know, So in a sense, this is something that works. Not a lot of people know about it, but we want you to really, really think about this one. So that's one for the first time You know, when you're starting up early. Um, the other way, is the experienced investor. Let's just say you have a home, right? You've been in a home, you have a town home or a single family home already. One of the things people do is if you're in a town home, you can buy, of course, a single family we talked about, but you're already set the, and you had you have equity in your home, you could take a, an, a HELOC, the question that was asked, you could take a HELOC and invest in another property, you know? Um, and then, you know, if you're getting into say five plus unit buildings, then, those are the commercial buildings. You can create an LLC to do that, but you need to, you need to do that with a commercial lender. Again, I'm not touching too much, but I'm giving you enough so that if that's an interest, of course, you can ping us, ask questions. Um, we've done it all, but this focus is more for the residential kind of investment tool. But you can buy, you can take your equity line out, buy, you know, if you want to buy another townhome next door to you, you could put 20% down and buy it because from an underwriter perspective, to just to be clear, underwriters, when they look at or a lender would 
when you're buying another townhome and you have a townhome, they look at that as if you're investing that, not as a move up. So that's why you have to put more down. Right, Mike? Yeah, exactly. So they're going to look at the type of property you have and it has to make sense. There's been scenarios where clients have downsized. I've had clients that live, uh, again, I know that people on this call are from all different areas. Since we're in the DMV, I'm going to use names of areas in the DMV. I apologize. But there's been scenarios where clients live a little bit further out of D.C. They might live in a townhouse and then they've decided to buy uh, you know, a condo in D.C. that's closer to work. We, those things work. But generally speaking, when you're buying a, the next property, usually an underwriter looks at it and, and, and it should be bigger or better. There should be some reason why. If, it, if it's smaller than what you have without a real explanation, generally it's an investment. We say that because investment properties have a little bit higher interest rates, but they also require larger down payments. Um, I, I, I'm not, I'd like to answer the question sort of as they come in. So someone else asked, um, and I apologize, I only have the, the letters of your name, RH. Um, I'm a teacher and I'm wondering if there's any program or discounts available. Uh, any of these kind of programs that are helping first time buyers or specifically people in certain professions, those programs are available for owner-occupied purchases, a property that you're going to live in. For investment properties, there aren't programs that will give you money to, um, to, to, for down payment for an investment purchase. So and, and a lot of those programs have some, some sort of a restriction or tie to make sure that you're staying there for Correct. three to five years. Absolutely. Because they're giving you the money for some reason, right, Mike? Yeah, huh? so... For example, the program in D.C., the program in Maryland, they're going to check to see if you're living in that property. If you don't live in that property, you owe the money back. So therefore, you know, generally speaking, th those programs are not the best for investment purchases because you might take them and then turn around and rent out the property quickly. And then you'll find yourself potentially owing the money back, which is not something that you want. So generally speaking, I wouldn't recommend those programs if you're planning on uh using the property as an investment property. One popular program people know about is NACA. We love NACA. We help a lot of clients with NACA. That being said, you know, that if that's your tool to buy your first property, NACA is very strict in how they manage that. So I just, I, you know, and it, I love the program. Don't get me wrong. But if we're talking investment, you, it's not one of those places where, okay, now I bought this property. It's my townhouse. And you move on and buy another one because they restrict that. That is your primary residence that you need to be there. So make sure you're clear in the rules. So, but I don't want to get specific into all the programs, yeah. but that's one program that's important to note. You can't use that as a tool to what we talked about. That will, you can't achieve that through that way. Sure. Okay. Okay. So with that, I'm going to go on to the next slide. You know, um, there's a couple of things also to think about as you're thinking about an, an, a, a property, right? So do I want equity in the home or cash flow? Again, we're going to use the DMV as an example, but something like this exists, I'm sure, in your area. Okay. For example, when somebody, if I'm buying a four unit building in Baltimore, I can cash flow that, you know, the rental income um, can cash flow much better, like a four unit property can be between 350 to 550 in, in Baltimore area. In Washington DC, a four unit property is gonna be somewhere between 750 to 950,000, a million plus. Now, five years from now, you know, in Baltimore, my cash flow will still be good. My value will not be that high, okay? But in DC, if you bought something for 750, I could tell you four, four units we sold five years ago for like 600,000, they're now, we're now selling them for 900. So then the other thing is, you know, so do you want the equity side of the house or the cash flow of the house? That's something to think about. Okay. Do you want a condo or do you want, you know, a bigger multifamily? Where and then where do you want to buy? Yanni mentioned that you need to know, assess your area and make sure you're buying within your area. In general, we advise that when you're buying these properties, because they will need attention, you know, they, they're, they're great equity, they're sources of great cash flow, but they, like anything else, you work for them, right? So you want to be able to drive an hour and be in your property. The general rule is, I think, within three hours of your where you live, you want to buy a property. That's gen the general advice. Um, but I would even tell you an hour to an hour and a half, you shouldn't exceed that because there's always going to be some challenges and you may need to pop over there to take a look. Um, so what's good for you? Think about whether it's equity or cash flow. And that's those are some decisions you need to make as an investor as you go forward. Okay. Um, can somebody read that? Because because I'm presenting, I don't want to 
show the chats if there's any questions that I need to answer. Yeah, right now it seems like nothing else. We're good right now. Okay. So what type of properties are out there? Okay. There's standard sale. Standard is say person has bought, uh, has owned, I'm going to focus on any investment. It could be has owned a condo or a townhome and they're now ready to sell it because maybe they're consolidating and buying something else. Maybe an investor bought too high or they, you know, they can't afford the payments if it's being foreclosed on. Auctions, it could be a house maybe auctioned. There are several reasons why people are auctions. It's not always because people are not in good financial state. Actually, some users, some sellers use auction houses because auction houses typically make the buyer pay the premium or the commission that um, they would have to pay if they were listing it with a traditional real estate household. Again, there are so many ways, there's so many reasons auctions happen, court ordered, it could be divorces, it could be several things, but auctions are not always negative. Just keep that in mind as well, okay? Um, but those are the types of places, with, those are the type of, type of homes you see on the market. Um, they can all be settled or done in 30 days to 45 days, meaning if you go make your offer, then uh, so once you make your offer, as long as it's accepted within 30, 40, 45 days, 60 days, it can be closed. When you are dealing with multifamilies, typically they take a little longer um, to get done. Um, foreclosures as well. But in general, you know, 45 to 60 days, you can get your closing, your everything done, okay? Um, purchase wise. So again, I, we talk about what's right for you. I, I, I make this important because if you're early on, you know, maybe it's a condo that you buy. So don't overextend yourself. You know, this is a long game. It's better to be successful by buying a condo and getting $250 a month and then eventually growing into a bigger unit where it's cash flowing three, $4,000 for you. Okay. Um, so whether you are in Fort Worth, Texas, or Dallas, or Detroit, uh, most cities I've, I'm mentioning I've been to, the, the real estate market is different in all of those areas. But um, this is something for you to decide and say, hey, what do I want to do? You know, and you want to act quickly um, and really fundamentally, but you have to be fundamentally sound. And I'm going to get into that in a minute um, in terms of what I mean by that when you're cash flowing. Okay. Um, Local regulations. This is really important. Again, we talk, we're talking about the local areas because we know the local area, but these types of rules exist just about everywhere. Okay. So when you're buying a property, you definitely want to understand what it costs. It's not just about the rental. Once you own a property, there are annual inspections typically that happen. Lead inspections happen. Um, and also, what are the security deposit rules for each area in Maryland, for example, when somebody has a security deposit with you and in most it's actually in most jurisdictions you need to keep it in a separate account and plus when they leave you know maybe you give them a little bit of an interest all those rules change but if somebody has deposited a thousand dollars with me for rent and they've been a perfect tenant typically i write them a check for maybe a thousand twenty five dollars or thirty dollars because they have it's accrued interest in maryland and that those are the laws um but also there are um the other one rule i want to mention is the, the tenant right to purchase in Washington, D.C. This is a really interesting law where I'm going to keep it a very high level, but it's important for you to understand because maybe something like this exists in anywhere where you're living, okay? So when you're buying a multifamily property um, in D.C., it's, if it's two units or more, the, the tenants have the right to actually match the contract that a buyer has submitted on the listing. And they have up to two weeks to match that. And what's even more interesting about this in Washington, D.C., even if that tenant cannot afford to buy their house, they can sell their right to somebody else to buy it, to, to, to somebody else to buy the property through them. What does this do? The person that bought the property is under contract can be bumped out if that tenant says, hey, I am able to buy, it. even though they're not buying and there's somebody, their proxy is really buying it. Um, they can do that. And DC gives them that rule. It, you, you know, we can have a, an all night conversation around that, what you think about it, but that's a rule we have to live with. So tenants have up to two weeks to go through this tenant rights and then sign off to say, look, I don't want this property. And they usually sign off. And once the seller has all of those tenants sign off, that's when really the transaction can, 
continue on. And Mike and I deal with this a lot where I make sure my, my clients' financing contingencies or anything don't begin until we have this topo right signed off because if the tenant comes in and decides to buy, we don't want the client to spend money on appraisal or home inspections on the property, okay? And in Maryland, there's also a first right of refusal law where if I'm selling a house to Sanofic, for example, and it's a private transaction, then we have to give the tenant the right to match that offer or then no, they know that they have, they, you know, we, we have to give them the right to say yes or no, I can buy this house if it's a private transaction. If it's a public transaction where I've listed the house, then we don't have to worry about that part. Virginia happens to be one of the more, a more landlord friendly Senate state in the, in the region, but that's really very rare. Most regions are, um, you know, tenant friendly, and that, that's no problem. You just need to understand the rules, work within the rules to make this work for everybody. We, you know, we want you to follow the rules, the guidelines, and really, in, especially in Washington or you're buying a multifamily way, we want you to, to have um, a property manager, especially at the beginning. Um, if it's just a simple condo you're buying, that's different. But if you're dealing with multifamilies, that's something that we really advise. Um, and then I'm going to stay on this for a little bit because one of the things that we find interesting is tenant, especially when you're doing this for the first time, understand tenants are people like you and I, okay? They need to be respected. They need to be um, also, you need to understand they have the right to, even though that's your building, it doesn't mean you're the boss of that building. You know, you need to make sure that you treat them like they're gold because effectively they're paying your mortgage and your retirement down the road. Okay. But sometimes people have as a way to speak down on people. You don't know why the tenant is why, why they are where they are. So really treat these tenants like you're your customers, like you're out of your job. How would you treat your boss? Effectively, they are your boss. They are your client. You know, Mike, you want to add a little bit on this? Uh. Uh, agreed. Uh, I wanted to. I want to touch your thing. There were two questions that came in. Also, okay. I'll okay. tell you them, and then I think we can. The first one, I'll. I. I think I'll grab. How are the okay. current interest rate heights affecting the type of investments you were discussing about? So the answer is uh, what you hear about in the news in general. Those are short term. Um, uh, those are short term interest rates that the Feds are are controlling. Uh, they have, they do have an effect per se on mortgage rates, but they're they're not. When the Fed say rates have gone up fifty basis points, seventy five basis points, doesn't mean that mortgage rates have gone up that much. But regardless, whatever the rate is, whether rates have gone up over the last few months, which they have, or the last few weeks, which they have, when you're looking at an investment property, you want to talk to a lender very clearly about what property you're looking to buy. Get an idea of what the total monthly payment is. I'm talking mortgage, taxes, insurance, HOA or condo dues, basically everything that you're going to pay on a monthly basis. Then you want to cross-reference that with your realtor, D, for example, and find out, hey, with the property in its current shape, what does rent look like? With the property in XYZ shape, if I fix it up, what does rent look like? If the delta between what your payment is and, the, and what the rent might be is, is what makes you comfortable to buy an investment. It doesn't matter if the rate is 5%, 10%, 3%. If the cash flow works, it works. And I have this conversation over and over again with investors because ultimately what rates are doing at that specific time, it, really you can't control it. I can't control it. D can't control it. You can figure out what rents are and you can figure out what your payment is. And if that number provides a return that you're comfortable with, then decide to make a move. The second question, uh, thank you all. Michael touched base on this, but for someone a little out of the DMV with the townhouse, would you advise as an investor's property under 500K in the DMV and also avoid investment requirements? Second piece to that question, also with the current economic situation like inflation and unstable stock exchange, would you sit out or do you think it's the right time to invest in real estate? So I'll answer the first part, uh, Biniam. The answer is yes. If you have a townhouse that's outside of the city and you're looking to potentially move closer to the city, you, you can buy a like property or maybe even a smaller property um, and potentially do that as a owner occupied, which allows you to put a lower down payment, say 5% versus 15 to 25%, also allows you to get lower rates. The last piece, I, I can only answer you 
what I'm doing personally, I'm still looking for an investment. If something comes up that, that piques my interest, I'm buying. I've been buying since 2011. I've bought in 2020 when people said the market's at its height. I bought in 2021 when people have said the market's at its height. I'm still looking in 2022, but it's a very competitive market. So I'm not, it's not so quick that I'm going to get what I want at the terms I want. But I, I, I'm not saying, oh, you know, the stock market is declining. I'm sitting out. I have certain fundamentals that I look for when I invest, uh, how much money is going to come out of pocket, how much the property is going to cash flow, and, you know, sort of if there's some potential for um, additional equity if I fix it up. And if, and if I hit those fundamentals, I really don't care what CNN is saying or, or really, because ultimately I'm not, we're not talking about investments where you're looking to buy it today and sell it tomorrow. We're talking about building out cash flow and long-term investments. So regardless of what's going on with the market, I personally am still looking to invest. So I answered and those two questions. D, I'll let you touch on them. Those, this is what I will say to you. Bottom, I'm gonna, my next slide is actually going to get into a little bit more um, the fundamentals okay, of what we do. But the bottom line is when you buy a, an investment property, if the rent, like worst case scenario, what happens? Can it rent and can it meet obligations? And these are basic fundamentals you have to look at. When you're buying your own personal residence, you may look at it differently, but because you can say, I can afford to live and pay a little bit more. But in an investment property, you have to be savvy about it. You have to, it has to make sense financially. And this is why also, even in the craziness of the market, okay, even when things were crazy in the townhome and the single family market, because investors and lenders look for investment property to cash flow at a certain point. That's why the multifamily market or people that are investing didn't go crazy. Those numbers still stayed. There's a fundamental by which you have to operate that doesn't change no matter what the interest rate is doing, no matter what the market is doing. Okay. So I would tell you to go ahead and continue to buy. There's a lot of people that are saying out there, hey, the market is going to go down. They're thinking about about 208, 209, the window time to 2008, 2009, that I don't think is coming anytime soon. There's a housing shortage has had, has been there for a long time. And we don't think that we're going to go down to those days. I mean, I was an agent through that time. I bought houses through that time and lost some money on that time. So it's not just all perfect. Um, to be honest, I, I was aggressive in that market. I learned my lesson. Um, lost a couple hundred thousand dollars in real estate, but you know, you live and learn. Not only have we made money, we've lost money in it. I'm being transparent with you. So, you know, uh, as well, but you have to be conservative. And as long as, like Mike said, the fundamentals are there, you, you continue. Okay. Um, so let me just, so if you haven't, uh, if you have been multitasking, now I want you to pay attention. You follow me. I'm about to get into a few things here that are really, really, really important. So again, Pay attention because this, if you don't pay attention to any slide that we talked about, let's talk about this slide. This uses a $500,000 um, example. And I'm just going to talk about the first two ways in which investment is calculated. And we all have our own different ways, but I'm going to just cap, talk about it really quickly here. Okay. Let's just say you have a $500,000 property and um, it makes $5,000 a month. Okay. So the $60,000 is the rental income annually, okay? Divided by 500,000, you see it at 12%. So in earlier, I talked about, there are two ways you can think of your market, either equity or cash flow. If you're looking in the cash flow for cash flow, then eight to 10 eight to 12% is the kind of cap calculation. This is, calculate, this is called cap, cap calculation that you're looking for. So in Baltimore, I would look for a property to have at least eight to 12%. OK, in Washington, D.C., where it's a lot more, there's also a lot of equity that can be driven more. You're looking for it to be more to four, four to six percent cap return. And a lot of investors or a lot of agents that are investor savvy, they will present caps calculations like this. The other way people look at this is cash on cash. OK, meaning how much money did I put down? OK, so you put down one hundred thousand dollars to buy um, to buy a property. Um, and then how much time will it take me to get it back? You know, a 15 to 20% window of time is perfect. Basically, think about it. If you made $20,000 a year in, in profit from your, you know, after, after you paid your expenses, say, um, after you paid your expenses, you made $20,000, um, then 
if you made that back over five years or 20, like I said, 10 to 20%, then the ideal number is really to get all of your money back that you put down in, in five years or less. That's the goal. Um, everybody will discuss this differently. So I'm just giving you kind of a flavor and I'm sure you guys will research this and there's so many versions of this out there, but in general, the cash on cash, how quickly do I get my money back? And the cap calculations are the most popular ways by which we measure investment properties. And when I advise you as your agent, this is what I look at. If a million, if a property, a four unit property is listed at $1.1 million and it's only making $4,000 a month, it doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? So this is why, the, this is where the investment, this is not an emotional decision. This is a numbers decision. And if the numbers don't make sense when you buy it, guess what? It's not going to make sense after you buy it. Unless you're buying a property that needs a lot of renovation, the cash rent, the rents are low, but also the numbers should be that low, that much lower when you're acquiring it. Okay. There's a lot of other ways. The other, I'm just going to give you just kind of high level. Mike actually has a, a way he looks at this stuff, but like, let's just say it's a four unit building again. Typically, even if these numbers don't get met, three of those four, three of those units should cover your expenses, meaning your mortgage, taxes, the everything that expenses the property. And the fourth unit should really be your cash flow. That's another way some, some investors will look at it that don't want to deal with the caps or and all that. Mike, you have a way of like, what's the one part, what's your approach? Yeah, I, I look at uh, two different things. Uh, it's very hard in the DC market. It, it's practically impossible, but I look at the total purchase price and I want the gross rent to be as close to 1% as possible. In, in Baltimore, I've seen it be more than that. I mean, sometimes I see a $350,000 you know, four family and the gross rents are 4,000. So it's already above 1% of the, the purchase price. But, you know, you're buying a $200,000 townhouse. 1% of that is somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000. So if the rent's 1,800, 1,900, somewhere in that range, 2,000, you're there. You're buying a, you know, a $1 million property in DC. If the rent's not eight, nine, 10,000, that doesn't attract me. But as D said, it's, it's harder in DC. DC, is more, Dean referenced it now two or three times. On the DC side, you might be playing an equity. Hey, I'm gonna invest in this particular market that might be a little cheaper now because over XYZ years, this is gonna happen and the prices are gonna explode. That's a different kind of investment. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, you can make a lot of money doing that, but you're not gonna see the same factors that we're referencing when it comes to cap rates, cash on cash, getting your money back. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, there's different styles. So, that, so that's, that's what I'm doing. But this right here is the fundamentals and the crux and the nuts and the bolts of what makes an investment property. And then, you know, when you're working in an, with an agent and you're working away from the DMV or hopefully, you know, so like you need to understand People that, that agents, you know, like you need to really work with somebody that knows what the heck they're doing. You know what I mean? Because if they're not sitting down and talking to you with these numbers and making sure the cash flow works, like, oh, go, go buy it. This makes a good investment. Why? It has to make sense, period. Okay. So, and so a more seasoned agent is going to know this. And somebody that has invested, that has helped investors invest, this is the, these are the types of numbers that they present you. You're like, well, it makes sense. Or not, and some people will buy based on future rents as long as you could prove the future rents are real. Okay, right. so hopefully, I think you I've explained this enough. If you have questions, you know we have contacts. I'm sure Sunafik will share our contacts with you. You can hit us up, and this is what I do. I love doing all day, um, but we don't have all day today. So, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, but this is really important for us to understand fundamentals, cash flow. Without that. No investment property makes any sense and you shouldn't buy it, period. Nothing nothing personal against the property, it's just business. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll say it in one second just to reiterate on D. If, if, and, and again, you may be in a different market. At the bare minimum, if the rent is not covering at least your mortgage plus something, it, it is not a good move to get into that investment because- any little item goes wrong, you're in the negative uh, on that. So you want to have room for yourself. But D, go to the next slide. Yeah, no, I'm just saying you got it has to make, it has to cover itself in some way. You know, 
is this investment you're investing a hundred thousand you shouldn't be expected to spend more money into that building period i mean it should cover itself if it doesn't then something needs to change you need to offer lower or not okay so this is very typical what happens so once we've given all that analysis we put together the sales contract the pre-approval that you get from a lender like mike and then earnest money deposit goes down which is earnest money deposit on a five hundred thousand dollar property typically is you know, about five thousand dollars one percent of what we purchase. Okay, one percent of the purchase price is what we use. That that's part of your down payment. We you just show it to show your 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 um, earnestness or sincereness and seriousness about the contract. And it's part of a contract is not complete without an earnest money deposit anyway by law in most areas. Um, you do that, and we submit that offer to the seller. Um, you know, typically, and then the things we negotiate sales prices negotiated, seller subsidy or closing help. Um, when you're an investment in the investment market, some sellers may not be too happy to give you closing help, but we ask for it. Settlement date is typically negotiated. And typically these settlements do take 45 to 60 days. Items, to things that convey, you know, um, in most multifamily properties or any unit, you know, stove, microwave, anything that's attached to the property typically comes with the property. In some investment properties, maybe the, 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 the tenant may have bought their own washer dryer. In that case, whatever is the seller's comes to you. Whatever is not the seller's doesn't come to you. Okay. And then contingencies. We talk about a lot about contingencies, you know, so once you've gotten under contract, the contingencies are financing. You still need, you know, typically 45 to 60 days, whatever the window of time is. We have a financing contingency. We also have a contingency around the leases, right? Make sure that seller is giving you the, the leases that they have said, that in the leases to prove the way they posted the property. Leases, making sure they have good um, all those legal, uh, all those regulations that I talked about, property registration, the lead certificates, the current lead certificates, the current uh, business licenses, whatever it is for that particular region, we, your agent, I, I usually ask for it to be given to me as proof three to five days after the ratification of the contract. Because you as an investor are buying, assuming, hey, it's in good standing. It has, it means that currently it's under good standing with, and it meets all the legal requirements. If it doesn't, that costs you money. So if it costs you money, that means you probably have to offer the seller more, ask the seller to bring it current by settlement or get more money from them so you can bring it current. Okay, because those things cost money. All right. Um, so those are the contingencies. So those are the key things, the home inspection, appraisal, financing are typically those contingencies, plus all the leases and everything that we ask for in a contingency, okay? Um, the moment of truth is typically, usually as an investor, you may get a rejection from a, a, a sell, uh, because you may offer a little low because remember we talked about these numbers have to make sense. So if the number is making sense at 100,000 below list price, you give it to them. If they say no, then it's their loss or you tell them, look, this is my reason. Usually when I submit an offer for a client, it's a much significantly lower. I usually provide proof of why we're doing that. You know, we say, look, based on the comps, based on the cash flow, based on the rents, your list of million dollars doesn't make sense. It really makes sense more at 875. Um, and there's also the reverse, right? Like where property is under listed. In that case, we quickly submit the offer, get it because we want the client to win. Okay. Um, but the counter happens. And then, you know, ultimately there's an acceptance of a, a price, a contract, based on the both terms that the buyer and seller have agreed on. Um, and then typically this is your, this is one of my other favorite slides. You know, the 45 to 60 days I talk about for investment is real. First couple of weeks, you don't fall in love with that property at all, but it's happening with the home inspection, termite inspection. At the same time, a lender like Mike is ordering appraisals and asking you for more documents. All of those are happening at the same time. Really the first two to three weeks, a lot of, you know, if the appraisal doesn't work out or home inspection negotiations don't work, that's when you contracts can get terminated. Okay. So, um, but all oh, of them are happening at the same one, time. Go ahead. Yeah. So the appraisal for an investment, it's unique on a typical purchase. When you're purchasing a home, all we check is, is that home worth what you're paying on an investment? We check two things. We check that the home is worth the value you're paying, meaning the contract price that the home is at least worth that. But in addition, we also have an appraiser tell us as a lender what the potential rent is going to be. And as a lender, we want to know that. So it's important to understand that those two items are important. 
And while you're at that, the other thing was for a multifamily specifically, okay? Let's just say a multifamily, um, there are four units. One of them we assume you're going to live in, right? But the other three, they make $5,000 a month, right? Does that, Mike, that gets added to the somebody, if you're only qualified for 500,000, but then, but just or you personally, but when you're buying a multifamily, those rents, those additional $5,000, they will qualify you for a higher amount, right? Correct. Mike? So if you're looking to purchase your own property, a multifamily that you want to live in one and then rent out the second, third, fourth unit or however many units it has, we will give you credit for 75% of what an appraiser tell us tells us the other units will rent for, and it helps you qualify for more. I, you know, I'm we're not sitting here to brag or anything. I can tell you we have clients. I, I've worked with D with these clients that have bought four unit multifamilies for almost a million dollars. If they came to me to buy a regular home, they were not going to qualify for a million dollars. They qualified because of the rents of those units count as income. So it's uh you know, you have to know going in the, the risks, but it certainly helps you qualify for a lot more with the rent. On a traditional investment, same idea. The future rent helps you qualify. So it's not that for every home you own, you have to have enough income to, to qualify for every single home. It's you got to qualify for the home you live in and the debts you have. But then for the investments, we're looking at what the rents are to help you qualify. And that's how you have scenarios where people own five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 properties. It's not that their incomes are so much that they they qualify for so many properties. The rents of the properties could qualify for themselves. So it's important to know that. Yep. So it's really like, this is why we're talking about this from a wealth building perspective and not just talking to you about, that's why you as your members voted for an investment tool. And these are investments. We're talking, you know, just like a real estate being one of your, many portfolios of wealth building that whether with your stocks, wherever else you have 401ks, whatever it may be you have, but now real estate becomes one of them. So the next thing we're almost done here. Um, communication is really important guys. I mean, whether it's to your, when deadlines happen, right? When you get under contract within seven days, you have to do that home inspection. Me as your agent, I can't reach you and schedule this. And that seven day passes. Guess what? That right is gone. Cause that's the contract. It's seven days from the ratification and Mike, needs your, you know, uh, you, you to apply a certain way of sign certain documents and lock your interest rates on and on and on. Time is important. Communication is key. Really, really key. Okay. To bring this all together, I have one last slide here um, that I want to share with you. So this gives you kind of a high level number, you know, down payments are typically, if assuming you're, you know, assuming you've gone through the first two or three properties you bought with 5% down, if you're really putting 20% down, you know, look at that. Out of 500K, you're looking at $100,000 investment. You know, typically closing costs are 3% of the purchase price. So for a $500,000 property, that's about $15,000 you're talking about. So, and then for home inspection, you know, you're now in the big leagues where you're investing, you know, in bigger units. So they cost anywhere between 700, 800 to 1200, $1,500. Okay. And then termite inspections cost money and appraisals will can go up to 800, 1000, 1200, right, Mike, for these larger unit. Properties. Correct. So if a re I'll give uh, some, some numbers. And again, this is DMV area, but it, the, the, the difference is sort of the same regardless of market. So a traditional appraisal, we charge about $535 for it. That's a traditional appraisal when you're going to live in the property. Bump up to an investment, it goes up to about $650, $700. Bump up to uh, multifamilies, you're talking $800, could be $1,000 for an appraisal. So at, at that point, in some cases, it could be double, but it's certainly a higher appraisal amount. So all in all, you know, we want you to think about you know, this being... Um, an investment tool for you. And we hope that, you know, through this, you know, in this past hour, we've given you kind of an insight, uh, a peek into what it looks like to really use real estate as an investment tool. Um, and we really appreciate having you here. Um, and of course, we're here if you have any questions. And I, I'm going to think Mike has Yanni, a, go ahead. Mike, uh, yeah, a question. I, I want to, before Yanni, uh, closes it out. I, there's, yeah. I want to go over 
we went over a lot about the mechanics, what you should be looking for. I'd be remiss if I don't share some tips and tricks, right? I mean, there. Yeah. Right. Oh, before you do that, can, there's a question right there. I don't know if you guys answered that. Oh, about, uh, Solomon, um, uh, Solomon asked. Uh, so, so that one, is that on social media? The last one I no, saw. No, the one, it's, it's on the Zoom right there. It's so, choosing arm over fix for multifamily in D.C., playing equity game, rates going crazy is what is what he wrote. Uh, but um, it's on the, the Q&A on Zoom. Uh, okay. My, the last one I can you read to me because the last one I see is from Benny. There it is. Choosing arm or a fix. Arm over fix from multifamily in DC playing equity game. So again, I'm not sure exactly. Oh, you're, he's asking if I'm playing the equity game, should I choose an arm over yeah. a, a, a fix? I mean, if this is one of your earlier investments, I generally recommend taking a fixed rate 30 year. Uh, if you can see some real savings on an arm, it may be worth it. it. You reference the fact that you're going to be playing the equity game. So it might be getting in and out within a short period of time. So if you think you're going to get in and out of the property in two, three years, and you take a five-year arm, you gave yourself a little extra buffer. There's seven-year arms, there's 10-year arms. If you're playing the cash flow sort of game and you want to hold it long-term, generally I would run numbers on a 30-year fix. If rates drop, refi them later, but lock in what you can for a 30-year. If you're looking to buy this and turn around and sell it in a couple of years because you think an area is going to pop, you know, then I would say the amount of years you're thinking of owning it, add about at least two and then look at it an arm that way. So if you're saying, hey, I'm going to hold this five years, don't take a five year arm, take seven and, and so on and so forth. So hopefully that answers that. Um, the couple of tricks that I want to share, I mean, I, I, literally we could sit here until midnight. I know that uh, if nobody wants to do that. But the tricks that I want to share, a few, right? Someone talked about you own a current home, get a home equity line of credit set up. You don't have to draw on that until you find find your next property. Use that home equity line of credit to put down the money on your next property. That's number one. Number two, um, these aren't necessarily tricks, but they're just ideas to talk about. If you and some friends want to buy an investment, there's nothing that stops you from having you and your friend on the loan. I've done loans where we've had four different partners that, that you know, a husband, a wife, and then two other friends all on a loan together. You can each go on a loan and participate in a property. You'd each go on the title. Um, other ideas, obviously people ask me this all the time. Hey, like what's the easiest way to get into an investment? And I answer the same every way. The easiest way to buy an investment is not to run out and, and necessarily buy an investment. It's turn your property that you live in into a rental and go buy something else to live in. You've now created your first rental property and it's a property you already own. Like that, that is absolutely the easiest way. You, you cannot beat doing that. Do that a couple of times, you build wealth. The other thing that we didn't touch on and I'll, I'll touch on it very quickly um, when we talk about, everybody says buy investments, build wealth, build wealth, build wealth. What does that really mean? All of this really comes down to leverage. By leverage, what I'm saying is you're going to go buy a property for $500,000. Maybe you're going to put 20% down, which is 100000 If that property goes up in a year, 5%, it, the 5% is on the 500000 not on the 100 you put out. So the, the money that you're building in equity is based on the leverage where a lender is loaning you 80% of the money. Or in the case we're talking about turning your primary into a rental, they're lending you 95% of the money. The other piece of it is, is as the rent is being paid to you, you're paying down your mortgage. So therefore your mortgage balance is going lower each month. Someone else is paying that for you and you're building equity. The last thing that I wanna to touch on and I'm a mortgage lender. I'm not a tax preparer. I'm not an accountant. But once you purchase investment properties, you will have additional write-offs that you do not see today. You're going to fill out, most people that own an investment property, they, they, they file a Schedule uh, E. On that Schedule E, you are writing off the mortgage interest. You're writing off the insurance, the taxes. You're depreciating the property year after year. You're writing off expenses that you have on that property, maybe getting a, a realtor to rent it out, time you spend in the car. So at the end of the day, you're creating 
a write-off on that income that you're going to have year after year. And, and there's a huge benefit to doing that, especially if you make higher income. I mean, it, you know, you buy a stock that pays you a dividend, you're paying tax on that dividend year after year after year. You buy an investment property, you're bringing in rent, and then you're actually writing off things from that property as well. So there's a huge benefit to doing it. I mean, the long and the short, you should have a diversified portfolio, invest in retirement, invest in stocks. But if you're not, if you haven't done the real estate part, talk to an accountant, talk to D, talk to myself, because there, there's going to be some real benefits to you from a tax standpoint for owning an investment property. Those are some of the things that I, that I want to share. Um, and you yeah. know, I'll let Yanni close it out. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of information and it's hard to kind of compress it to all of this. But ultimately, everybody's at different stages in terms of investment. Ultimately, look at real estate as obviously the reason why you buy a home sometimes is you're gonna you're gonna have to you're gonna have to, to pay to live somewhere. And same again, ultimately you might as well you buy a mortgage that you pay yourself. Okay. So if you're thinking about investment, uh investment, you don't have to necessarily maybe you know some of the things that we talked about are uh maybe a longer reach than you. But again, baby steps of of investment is again, you know, renting out, let's just say you have a property, a townhouse, renting out your basement, right? Uh uh to get some cash flow to a property to alleviate some of your your mortgage, right? Um ultimately. Uh, renting out a room or ultimately maybe even renting out your property uh, on an Airbnb for a weekend or so, right? Um, so those are kind of baby steps. But as of, even as a first time home buyer, there's things that we talked about to accelerate your, to accelerate your, your investment portfolio, whether it be buying your, an investment pro, uh, a multifamily for your first property, ultimately there, that, that really accelerates that. But you can do as, as, as D had a slide, the, the five to 10 year plan, um, that can actually be done in three or four years, right? Uh, ultimately, you just have to live in the property one year uh, using a first-time home buyer program. Then again, like as Dee mentioned, you can use a 5% conventional loan to buy the bigger property. And then again, you rent that out as well and then buy another property. So that is, you know, we made a video a few, a few weeks ago, three properties in three years with low money down using, you know, those three and a half percent or Five uh, percent down, five percent down. Okay, um, somebody mentioned the the actual um, rates going crazy, and you know with, uh, all the things that are happening. You know, you probably have heard buy the dip, right? Buy the dip. But keep in mind, when rates increase, what happens is demand drops in terms of buyers on the market drops. So whether you're buying your personal property or an investment property, you generally going to be you can generally going to see less people. Uh, uh, whether it be competing to, to purchase uh, to, to purchase a property, which gives you a better chance to get your offer accepted or get a better deal on that investment property. Ultimately, with investment properties, it has to make sense uh, when it comes to numbers. So as long as those numbers work, uh, they, they work. So again, we try to compress this as much as possible, uh, but obviously we're available to uh, sit down with you over Zoom, anything of that sort, to kind of give you a more of a detailed uh, 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 explanation for your specific situation. So on behalf of D, Michael, uh, um, and uh, your DMV team, we thank you for the opportunity. So now, uh, we thank you so much for, uh, for this, uh, you know, this uh, opportunity to, to educate and empower people. So uh, thank you so much, uh, guys. Uh, and um, uh, you know how to reach us. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I don't think there are any more questions in the chat with the exception of Biniam. I think he's asking if the team's available for a consultation and-, and um, we're, all, we're always yeah. available for consultation. Always, always. available. <laughs> seven, uh, days a week, seven days a week. Uh, and I was kind of posting some tidbits on, on socials, just a quick check to see if there have been any questions, um, which doesn't look like there were. We'll be posting this recording on YouTube as well. So thank you to everybody who attended and thank you, your DMB team, for this exciting session. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care, guys. Have a good night.